Hi everyone, and welcome to Scaling Climate Solutions. We're honored to have an audience of this caliber join us in this conversation with leading minds across the development, business, and social enterprise sectors. I'm Natalie Evans of Nextleaf Analytics. I want to thank our generous sponsors, Qualcomm Wireless Reach and the Autodesk Foundation for hosting us in this amazing space. So we'll show a short film trailer to introduce our first speaker. SDG 9 is recognition of the importance of connectivity, technology and innovation. If we're talking about the underserved population in the world, computers are a distant dream, but a mobile phone is an immediate reality. Five billion individuals have access to some sort of mobile phone. Curso de los más pobres, pero el mar ha sido ha sido algo que nos han quitado. Bueno, la pesca ha venido cambiando simultáneamente con el cambio climático. Antes de salir, yo averiguo en la tableta si no va a haber mal tiempo. This typhoon was the most powerful ever to make landfall. The number of those feared dead begins at 10,000. Nung dumating yung Yolanda, halos wala kami masilungan, alam makain, eh, takot na takot kami lahat. The UN estimates 600,000 people have been displaced by this disaster. Tapos nung nasa loob na kami, lahat ng bahay sa likod, nag-iba na kasama yung sa amin. Whether these are natural or, or man-made, We've gone through a lot of difficulties. Technology is always the great enabler and the great equalizer. Mobile, broadband, cloud means I can reach farther, faster, deeper, cheaper in and around the world. This is the future that we can all work towards. A world with prosperity for all people, the environment is safe and protected, and we can achieve it if we commit to doing it along these goals. It's my pleasure to introduce Angela Baker, Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at Qualcomm. Angela oversees a portfolio of programs that empower people through technology and training, including Qualcomm Wireless Reach, a strategic initiative that brings wireless technology to underserved communities globally. She oversees Qualcomm's sustainability and reporting program and the company's numerous STEM engagement programs. Angela. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, so that video gives you a little bit of an idea of what we do, and I'm just going to give a, a highlight. But I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. Thank you so much, Natalie, for the introduction, and Nithya for inviting us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Qualcomm and Qualcomm Wireless Reach and about the work that we do with NextLeaf. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Qualcomm, we are uh, a leader in next generation technologies. So over the last 30 years, we, our ideas and innovations have driven the evolution of wireless communications, connecting people more closely to information, entertainment, and most importantly, each other. So basically, we make the insides of your phones and devices that connect them to the internet. At Qualcomm, we know that wireless technology is not just an enabler, it's a, a game changer. We're motivated by how our technologies can improve people's lives, from enhancing education and healthcare to sustaining the environment and creating jobs. One of the ways that we're proving this is through Qualcomm Wireless Reach, which you just saw in the video, our strategic corporate social responsibility initiative that collaborates with partners across governments, industries, and geographies to bring advanced wireless technologies to where they're most needed. Our goal is to create sustainable programs that strengthen economic and social development around the globe. We align our programs with the UN Sustainable Development Goals with a focus on goal nine, to build resilient infrastructure promote sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. 
We want to demonstrate to governments and leaders around the world that expanding access to mobile broadband to all citizens creates limitless opportunities and drives innovation that benefits the communities in which we work and live. We also believe that our innovations can empower people on the ground to meet all of the SDGs. Over the last 12 years, Wireless Reach has invested in over 100 programs in nearly 50 countries, working with 650 different partner organizations and impacting more than 14 million people. You might ask yourself why a company like Qualcomm invests in these types of programs, but we know that business cannot thrive in a world that's failing. At Qualcomm Wireless Reach, we're looking at how our technology that we create can be leveraged for education, healthcare, entrepreneurship, public safety, and what I'll speak just a little bit about today, climate change and environmental degradation in different communities. In India, Brazil, Colombia, and Senegal, we're working with fishermen to introduce advanced mobile technologies to help them earn livelihoods in a safer and more profitable manner. You saw some footage in the video from our Colombia program. Fishermen in India's coastal communities have, for generations, earned their livelihoods by relying on their traditional knowledge of the sea. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami changed the sea's conditions, making traditional knowledge of potential fishing zones obsolete. In Senegal, climate change and industrialized fishing have caused a significant decline in the number and diversity of species in local marine ecosystems. Reducing the catch and profitability of traditional fishermen and making it increasingly difficult for them to earn a living. Even though the challenges in, the, in some of these communities are similar, such as pollution and climate change affecting fish habitats, it's not surprising that the approach we take in each community is different. By working with governments and community leaders, we can ensure that each program is meeting critical but local needs. In the case of the fishing programs, each uh, participant is given a 3G or 4G LTE connected tablet or smartphone, customized applications, and training to support mobile education, improve business practices, and the development of new economic activities. The overall goal of this program is to reduce poverty by raising productivity and income in these often underserved areas. For example, in India, the adoption of mobile has resulted in a 15% increase in average monthly income among participating fishermen. Switching gears a bit, to feed the projected population in 2050, it's estimated that agriculture production must increase by 70%, posing a huge environmental impact. Farming needs to become more productive while simultaneously decreasing the environmental impact of food production. Drone-powered solutions for agriculture are one of the largest commercial applications for UAVs. But we know that these solutions cannot be designed and only made available to large farms. To make the necessary gains in productivity and mitigate environmental degradation, smallholder farmers, who make up over 80% of the world's farms and who provide 80% of the food that's consumed in most of the developing world, need access to these technologies as well. That's why at Qualcomm, we're innovating affordable and improved onboard systems for drones that will be able to provide immediate, actionable agricultural intelligence to small and medium-sized farms in Brazil. We've field tested the proof of concept drone technology and are currently evaluating its economic and social impact amongst family farmers. Farmers will have access to precise crop intelligence metrics and recommendations for taking specific actions corresponding to that intelligence, such as when to irrigate or fertilize in order to produce higher crop yields. The ability to pinpoint areas needing action allows for spot application rather than whole field treatment, which reduces the negative impact, impacts to the environment. As a company, Qualcomm pushes the boundaries of what's possible in technology. This allows innovators, like Nextleaf, to create solutions that have global social impact. Every day, three billion people rely on fires inside their homes to cook and to provide light and heat. Exposure to the resulting household smoke kills more people each year than malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS combined. These fires also contribute significantly to global climate change. The world rallied around a solution, introducing cleaner burning manufactured cookstoves for the rural poor. However, these interventions lack the necessary data to bring these solutions to scale. Nextleaf's, Nextleaf brings innovation in technology and data by combining an on-the-ground approach to public health and climate change interventions with continuous data monitoring. Our joint stove trace program has witnessed sustained clean cookstove usage at above 90% a rate previously unseen in the sector. 
This number demonstrates the power of data in the field and shows how people who are empowered by data create change and technologies that succeed, sustain, and scale. This is the purpose of Qualcomm Wireless Reach and why we continue to support innovators who are testing new solutions that can engage people on the ground, helping them to innovate and adapt to scale these solutions across new sectors. Qualcomm Wireless Reach was NextLeaf's first funder. We supported the development of StoveTrace, a sensor-based data analytic program originally conceived as a way to use Qualcomm chip-enabled smartphones to link clean cooking to carbon markets. From deploying their original prototypes in off-grid locations to monitoring a large-scale clean cooking intervention, Nextleaf learned important lessons, not just about the challenges of deploying wireless technologies to serve those living off the grid, but they also saw that user uptake of clean cook stoves over time was much lower than they had previously expected. Our work together continues today. The Stove Trace program rewards climate savings through mobile money and mobile payments. As Nextleaf continued to iterate their approach in response to the data findings, they also identified another application of their sensor-based platform, supporting vaccination for hard-to-reach populations. Today's Nextleaf's cold trace protects the vaccine supply for one in 10 babies born on Earth. And they've continued their original commitment to clean household energy, developing new sensor devices and enhancing their data platform to improve clean cooking interventions in real time. Technology and data has the power to address, the to address climate change and create rapid and effective responses. But we have to invest in the possibility and potential of these solutions over the long term to bring these solutions to scale. We have to be willing to support social enterprises and innovators like Nextleaf to help them succeed. Thanks. I'm also going to introduce you to the panel that's going to come up. So when I call you, just uh, come to stage. So the first is Helena Moline Valdez. She's the head of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat at the UN Environment Office in Paris, a position, position that she's held since 2013. Helena was a senior executive with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction as, and was UNISDR's regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean and worked with the Pan American Health Organization on hospital mitigation and disaster preparedness. You can come on up. <laughs> Manoj Kumar leads innovation and entrepreneurship for Tata Trust and is responsible for creating and supporting sustainable ventures that serve critical social, economic, and environmental needs. Manoj is also the architect of Social Alpha, an initiative to strengthen the science and technology startup ecosystem in India. Nithya Ramanathan is the CEO and co-founder of NextLeaf Analytics and our host a nonprofit dedicated to preserving human and planetary health by creating sensor technologies, intelligent data analytics, and data-driven solutions for global challenges. Nextleaf's sensor technologies are used to protect temperature-sensitive vaccines for newborns, reduce air pollution by incentivizing cleaner cooking, and protect produce for smallholder farmers. Rachel Kite is the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for, Sust for Sustainable Energy for All. She was formerly, formerly the World Bank Group VP and Special Envoy for Climate Change, VP for Sustainable Development, as well as a member of the IFC's management team. Rachel. Oh, we got our timing down now. We got our, our timing down. Kevin Starr directs the Mulago Foundation and is the founder and director of the Reiner Arnold Fellows Program. Mulago spends its money to drive forward the most promising ideas in health, development, and conservation in poor countries. The Reiner Arnold Fellows Program is an outgrowth of the foundation and works with the best emerging social entrepreneurs with solutions for less than two dollars for the less than two dollars a day world. Kevin. And tonight's panel is moderated by Jean Shaw, Head of Portfolio and Investment at Autodesk Foundation. Jean Shaw is the, that's her title, it says it again, where she oversees a portfolio of organizations using design for positive social and environmental impact. Jean has over 15 years of experience working across the public and private sectors in social entrepreneurship, economic development, finance, and strategic operations. Hello. Everybody can hear me, great. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thank you, Angela, for really setting the stage for this conversation and highlighting a lot of, I think, what are really critical issues to our conversation tonight. Um, uh, it's great to see you all here. There's so many uh, incredible events this week uh, going on with GCAS, and it's exciting to see people coming from all sectors to really address uh, the challenge of climate change together. And I think, 
when we think about this topic, uh, whether implicitly or explicitly, I think even represented at this um, at GCAS overall, there's a lot of emphasis on you know thinking about tackling climate change through mitigation solutions. So how do we address the cause of climate change? Let's reduce uh, carbon emissions. And you know while that's absolutely the right approach, especially when we're talking about the countries that em emit the most GHG uh, greenhouse gases, I think potentially it leaves out a whole other conversation around climate solutions that are needed for the three billion poorest people in the world, and of which, Angela, uh, you highlighted through all, all the great work that Qualcomm Wireless Reach is touching on as well. And I think that the panel here tonight can really help to elucid elucidate. So I hope this will be a really robust conversation that helps us expand you know, our thinking around climate solutions. Um, and maybe just uh, before we get right into things, a little bit of background around kind of how this event came together, you know, between Nextleaf, Autodesk, and others, and why this is an important issue for us. So um, similar to Qualcomm, I think with Autodesk, you know, as a company from our perspective, you know, we're focused on technology. We help people design and make pretty much anything. So whether it's a skyscraper or a car or even a movie, you know, this, um, the, we're creating the physical world around us uh, or helping to create the physical world around us through our customers. And so our motto uh, is more, better, less. Uh, and really what that means is we believe there's an inevitable march towards more. Like there's just gonna be more people on the planet and we're using more resources to make more things to power our lives. And so as a company, how do we help our customers and the world really think about doing that differently, uh, making better things, doing it more efficiently with less resources and less impact on the planet? And so I think this is really a top priority for our company and we're actually making tools that directly support this objective. And so that's our stake you know, in this climate challenge and why the Autodesk Foundation, you know, where I work, is really strategically focused on climate um, and looking to support technology innovations that address climate challenge in its, all its forms, both mitigation and adaptation. And so similar to Qualcomm, we partnered with Nextleaf also along some of the work in their cold chain, both for ag and vaccines. And I think a lot of the issues around data and the ability of emerging technologies like IoT to elucidate on what solutions uh, can actually work in the field uh, for climate, uh, uh, tackling climate change for the poorest three billion in the world, I think is something that you know deserves a lot more attention. So uh, I think with that, let's open it up to some questions for the, uh, for the panels. Great. I'm actually sitting next to the person I want to ask the first question to. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> so, you know, knowing uh, Mulago and uh, your role and also just the long history that Mulago has had being laser focused on uh, supporting solutions that meet the, bas uh, the basic needs of the very poor, uh, can you talk a little bit more about your approach to that and how kind of addressing the climate challenge fits in? Sure. Um, so, the, the, the quick and dirty, well, the answer to your first question is that um, this is just a little skin cancer thing and it'll be fine. <laughs> um, the second question was, uh, the quick and dirty answer to that is that when somebody brings something to us and says, this is going to save the world, we have four questions. And the first is, is it going to work? The second is, the first is, is it needed? The second is, does it work? The third is, will it be used well? And the fourth is, will it get to the people that need it most? And a lot of them. So I'll just use cook stoves as an example. So somebody comes and brings a clean cook stove to us. And so the first question is, is it needed? And we already answered that one tonight. The second question, does it work, has to do with real impact. So what's a clean cook stove supposed to do and what's good enough? Well, it turns out that the best science says that you need to remove the vast majority of pollutants in order to get a health benefit. Obviously, you have to remove the vast majority of, of black soot to get a climate benefit. So that means you need a really good stove. And 
that creates a problem because good stoves are expensive. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. OK, so now we know how to answer the second question. The third question, then, when you're looking at a stove, that's about the user. So what that means is we have to make sure the person uses it consistently. We need to know they use it exclusively, because if you have an old-fashioned stove burning in the corner, you don't get any benefit from a better stove. We have to make sure that it can be repaired. We have to make sure they can get the right fuel. So there's a whole set of questions, and a lot of that means we have to have the data that really show the pattern over time. And then the fourth question is often the toughest one that has to do with price and distribution channels and sales strategies, and how does this really get to the people who need it most? For stoves, it's especially tricky because the cheap stoves aren't good enough, and the good stoves aren't cheap enough. So you have to figure out what, where are the business models that will get expensive stoves into the hands of really poor people. And now through that series of four questions for us in, in the case of stoves, that narrows it down. In fact, we've only made exactly one investment so far in that space. So that's, that's the quick and dirty. Um, thank you for that. And I, I, I particularly like sort of how specific the cook stove example is and thinking about that also as a, a kind of climate solution. But maybe zooming up uh, and kind of looking at kind of bigger picture, uh, I want to ask uh, Rachel, you know, what do you see as sort of some of the uh, most critical challenges uh, that, you know, the poorest three billion are facing with respect to climate change and what are you seeing as emerging solutions that can address that so thank you very much um sorry it's uh, thank you to Autodesk and to Qualcomm it's it's quite an amazing space you've got here so thank you very much I come from I'm living on the other coast at the moment and this is sort of refreshing um <laughs> Uh, well, oh, I can't go home to Britain because we're in an even worse mess. So um, anyway, um, but, uh, you know, actually, let, let, I mean, I think we can zoom up, but starting starting with, with this question of clean cooking, because, you know, one of the... So sustainable energy for all is a sort of movement, and then there's a small team which sort of tries to act as the engine room of that movement where an engine room is needed. And what we're focused on is the critical path to success, taking government at their word. So government said, 193 governments, there was no gun to their head. You know, by 2030, we would be able to have universal access to energy. We'd be able to make it uh, a lot more efficient and we would be able to uh, have much more renewables in the mix, right? They agreed 16 other SDGs. You heard Qualcomm talk about SDG 9 in, in industrial um, uh, development, etc., and then just three months later, in 2015, they agreed the Paris Climate Agreement, which means that all of these goals have to be achieved uh, while we decarbonise the economy um, rapidly, right? Okay, and we have to leave no one behind. So our starting premise is we were serious when we said that, and that there is a chip cheaper, quicker, easier way to get there than you know than other, or and that we are actually going to get there. So, you, so then the question is. So if just under 3 billion people can't cook cleanly, uh, what on earth is going on that that would be the case today, right? So uh, it's 20, uh, well, it's now 2018, and three years ago it was 2015, you know, when Hillary made her big speech about this, it was 2005. I mean, this is not, this has been kicking around. So what, it, what is it that is stopping that from having, first of all, there is this extraordinary health impact, you know, Millions and millions of people dying every year. These are women and children predominantly. Um, uh, there's a huge uh, economic impact of that. There is an extraordinary impact on economy because those, many of those people are using uh, firewood or using charcoal or use, uh, they're cutting down much needed natural resources in order to find a cookie solution. There's a security problem because they're going out and they're you know, finding that in very unsafe conditions. Um, you know, the carbon market, the charcoal market in West Africa is a sort of mafia run, you know, nasty business. Um, and so there are multiple reasons why you would think this would be something that somebody would want to solve. Multiple reasons why it should be somewhere close to the top of the 
agenda, and it's not, right? And it's difficult, um, uh, you know, for, for a lot of the reasons and a lot more reasons. So where we enter, where we enter the, the, the equation is, do we have the data and evidence that is necessary to have the right kind of conversation, asking the right kind of question of the right kind of people? Do we have, uh, in addition to the data and evidence, is, is the partnership of the different people needed to be in the room likely or present, or can we make that happen? And then thirdly, can we talk about why this is important and talk about the impact you get if you can start to resolve it? So changing the narrative, telling the story, finding a way to communicate the issue. And, and what it means is that we, we won't start the sentence with climate change most of the time. Right? Most of the time you're talking about what clean energy will get you. Clean energy will get you a child that is not sick. Right? and a lower health bill. You know, clean energy gets you um, a hospital where the electricity doesn't go out 27 times a day and the one doctor on call can actually... You know, clean energy gets you a warm classroom so your child actually learns. doesn't just go, but goes and learns. So, so I think the final thing I would just say is that if, you're, if you come at it from climate change and you come down from the top, what often happens is you end up in a conversation about, oh my goodness be, there's a billion people who don't have access to energy. If we gave those billion people energy, <gasps> we would blow all of our climate projections out and we'd be in real trouble and suddenly the poor become the problem. They're not the problem. We can provide you know, clean electricity and clean uh, fuels for cooking to uh, uh, the billion people who don't have anything and the three billion people who don't have enough. Um, without uh, rocking the already sort of perilous climate projections. Um, and if we do that, then you start to build the kind of inclusive growth and the kind of inclusive economic strategies, which mean that you know, everybody's in, because politically, these amazing agreements that we made in 2015 don't work if that, glean, that clean, bright future is only a clean, bright future for the 1%, right? This has to work for everybody. So we, come, we try to come at it with the for all, of sustainable energy for all at the forefront because we think it opens up new partnerships and it opens up a new way of communicating. But for that, we need the data and evidence. Great, thank you. I think that's a good segue, and it's strange how my sequence of questions is just flowing down the line, so. <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to ask you then, Nithya, to kind of build on Rachel's comments and also kind of share with the audience, you know, in a bit more detail about the work at NextLeaf and kind of, um, you know, really just um, kind of unpacking a bit like the, the data that you're enabling for various sectors to be collected for the first time, you know, and what interventions that they involve and what you see as the role of this data in terms of helping to craft the right solutions, helping to build markets. Great, thanks, Jean. And thanks everybody for being here. We're, we're really psyched to be having this panel and hosting it with everybody here. So um, I, I won't uh, maybe repeat what I think has been said a number of times now about clean cooking. And, and, and by the way, this was really not rehearsed, I think. <laughs> You know, clean cooking is clearly um, on all of our minds. Um, and it is complex. Uh, we know that. Um, we need systems thinking. Um, and what we've seen is that, you know, we lack solutions that are usable and durable and affordable. And, um, you know, all of that's been said. So I'll kind of jump into sort of what NextLeaf has been doing and, and how we've been sort of working to generate more data. So. Um, at NextLeaf, um, both my co-founder, Martin Lukacs, and, and I, we actually started working on this in our PhDs, um, so uh, close to 20 years ago. Uh, we were building sensors together. And when we started NextLeaf, we realized that we could take um, low-cost, affordable, uh, accurate sensors and put them on uh, affordable cell phone technology and start to collect data that really hadn't been collected before. And then the question really became, who uh, can use this data, what can they do with it that would bring transformative change. Um, and so over the last 10 years, we've been working um, in clean cooking. Uh, we've you know, put sensors on hundreds and hundreds of households now. 
Um, with Project Surya and uh, UC San Diego, um, we deployed 5,000 cook stoves. We put wireless sensors on 500 of them. And, and we learned some things that um, you know, really kind of changed our perspective and I think a number of uh, people's perspectives in the sector. The first thing we learned is when you go and ask people, um, you don't necessarily get um, the answer that helps. So it turns out when you ask a woman who um, has been given a stove, how did you feel about that stove? Maybe you know three months later, um, you get an answer that goes something like, oh, it's great, yes, thank you. Um, and what we found over months and months and years of, of having the sensor data is we would say, oh, that's so funny because actually if you look at our dashboard with the sensor, we actually found that you were using it for four months, but then you stopped using it last month. What happened? And it turns out that when you ask a really focused question like that, um, you know, people want to share with you, and it starts to build trust, interestingly. You know, when a lot of people tell us, oh, sensors, big brother, you know, people don't want it. We have actually found that the sensors help generate a lot of trust. And it's not that the sensors give you the only data, but the sensors help open a real conversation. And then you hear the complex story of, oh, well, you know, my sister-in-law was here, and then this happened, and the stove got knocked over because, you know, and, and, but when you sort through that and you aggregate it over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of households, you start to see trends about what's working and what's not working and how can we fix them. And so that's a lot of what we think about at NextLeaf is, um, you know, sensors are not an end in of themselves. The data is not an end in of itself. But these are really powerful tools we've found, whether it's in vaccines, cold chains, or cook stoves, um, where it allows us to ask different questions and get really different answers. And so a couple of the trends that we saw, and I'll just share a few of these, is, is we found that when it comes to user friendliness, um, you know, we could do a little bit better um, in designing better uh, cooking solutions. Um, you know, women want very specific things. They know what they want. Um, and, and they're willing to share it if we ask the right questions in the right way at the right time, and, and that's what the data helped us do. Um, we also found that, you know, when you don't have properly incentivized supply chains and, and people who are, are paid to actually fix the stove, um, you know, it becomes a lot harder. And, and unlike solar panels, um, you know, which I think a lot of us in the cooking solution sector looked to, um, you know, solar panels don't break that often, it turns out. But uh, clean cook stoves break a little bit more often. And so the, the business models, the supply chains, you know, we have to think about those a little differently now. Um, and, you know, with the data, we actually now start to know how often cook stoves break. We have, you know, starting to get more accurate information on that. And that informs all sorts of things like new business models and, and how entrepreneurs can um, think about building businesses. And so just briefly, I'll talk a little about kind of what we see moving forward. Um, you know, as, as Rachel mentioned, we think that partnerships are a really critical part of this. We think um, in the next three years, we need to see a large-scale demonstration because scale, scale, scale. We have to be thinking scale, but we can't do it with the wrong solutions. So what we think is um, 10,000 households across India and, and one country at least in Africa as a starting point, possibly Nigeria, um, we need to be instrumenting households with uh, sensors. We need to be asking the same questions that we've been asking. Um, and we need to be testing a basket of solutions. Um, you have an energy ladder. You've got three rungs on that ladder. It starts with um, solid fuels like wood, but then you get to liquid fuels, and eventually you get to renewable electricity, powering cooking solutions, and that's where we need to go. But we need a basket of solutions that covers all of those rungs. And we need to be thinking about not only the user friendliness of the solutions, but how you finance these solutions. How are, what are the types of loans that we need? What are the sort of types of supply chains that we need? And with a demonstration in 10,000 households, um, we think that you start to get to the types of numbers that you need with the right partnerships in order to be able to measure and ask and, and get to these types of solutions and, and really think about, um, you know, how we design them. And so what I'll say finally is, um, you know, private sector partnerships are critical. We're really proud to be working with stove manufacturers to redesign the solutions. Um, public sector partnerships are critical. We're really proud to be working with Climate and Clean Air Coalition um, and others um, in the public sector side. And, you know, what NextLeaf brings, we want to kind of be really, f we are very focused and we bring better data so that we're not working in the dark and that we're sort of 
um, systematically moving um, in what we hope is the right direction. So, thank you. Great, I think you gave everybody a lot to think about there. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's definitely helpful to have the kind of practitioner's voice here, um, kind of, and also highlighting like the specific learnings and challenges. So, so uh, turning to Manoj, uh, you're, you're also the second kind of investor funder on the panel and with a track record at, with, at Tata Trust of incubating you know, dozens of entrepreneurs and if not hundreds and startups. Um, give us your perspective on the role of the investor uh, in uh, helping to bring some of these solutions to scale. Thank you. So, you know, while we talk about investment, but we come from a philanthropy background. Right? Yes. We are oldest charity in India, more than 125 year old, historically built institutions and worked on poverty alleviation, which continues to be our core area of focus, you know, how to help rural, tribal, underserved communities improve their livelihoods. And then we connect healthcare, education, you know, access to water, sanitation, etc., all with livelihoods and run multiple programs. Uh, we are a unique foundation that we, while we do grant making and we have about 500 uh, NGOs, civil society organizations in our portfolio who work with us, but we, all our large programs, we run it ourselves. So we are a direct implementation foundation where we actually have people working on the ground with the communities. So we implement our own programs as well. Uh, about three years back, we realized that we are facing a big market failure situation in India, not just the state failure, where uh, we, have, what we have seen over years that if you are innovating for social impact across sectors, whether it's climate change or water or agriculture or livelihoods, education, uh, very little investment is available in innovation and innovation-led entrepreneurship. So we started thinking about it and about two and a half years back we built our social alpha architecture where we invest in innovation in universities, in academic institutions, in India, outside India and create a pipeline of innovations. We also run grand challenges and, 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 and search, you know, technology search, uh, run entrepreneur in residence program where we encourage entrepreneurs to find the right technology for the problem statement that we curate with our, again, large number of NGO partners. <coughs> but what we realized that if we create a pipeline of innovations and entrepreneurs, we need an incubation mechanism to convert them into startups. So we are creating a nationwide network of incubator in partnership with other foundations and governments. Uh, and as we incubate these companies, we provide them seed capital, early stage uh, you know, access to capital, access to labs, mentoring, coaching, market access. Uh, and then we are raising actually a venture fund, which, you know, again, you know, you can, you, you can think of a philanthropy getting into investment, and there is a serious gap in the investable, uh, you know, investment capital in the market. So we run this three-tier architecture, right from innovation to incubation to accelerating these startups into the growth stage. Uh, so we think that as philanthropy, uh, it's, you know, if we don't build this ecosystem, right, it's actually an ecosystem play. Eventually, I think we have seen government is starting to support us and some foundations are showing interest, but we have to build this ecosystem. This ecosystem exists for commercial world, right? So in automobile or pharma or aerospace engineering, you have right from innovation idea to building ventures and connectivity with the industry, but in, in the social sector where we have years of underinvestment uh, in post-colonial developing world, uh, it's increasingly important for philanthropy to build that ecosystem. So we think of ourselves as, you know, ecosystem creator, and we will continue to do a few experiments till the market evolves and other players start coming. Great, thank you. Well, Helena, turning to you, uh, I uh, wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalitions. What are some of the kind of high-level priorities are for the organization as, um, you know, the focus areas as it relates to this conversation today around, you know, solutions and the poor? 
Yeah, it's interesting to listen to what has been said already, and I was thinking what could I contribute. So maybe just to say what we do to give that as a context. So back six years, well, here we have one of the, um, the founders of the concept of, uh, not the concept, but how information research and results have demonstrated that there are many ways that uh, and emissions that contribute to climate change beyond the CO2, which has been, of course, the driver of the, the climate nego discussions since the last 20 years. But the fact that air pollution, air pollutants, and I'm not going to go into the scientific speech here because I would feel very embarrassed, but, but the fact that uh, aerosols and black carbon in particular, soot that you mentioned before, uh, together with methane and hydrofluorocarbons, uh, component of cooling, particularly, but also foam and other things, have have huge impact uh, as drivers of climate change. And this is an important um, data-driven and scientific finding that led to uh, a number of countries uh, taking uh, the initiative to do something about it quickly, because the climate they, they came from the climate angle because it was a dragging negotiation and trying to get an agreement to, 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 to together solve the climate problem while, let's say, um, the situation didn't wait for a solution or an agreement being made, right? So what I want to say is that based on this kind of data and information and assessment, the scientific integrated assessment that demonstrated very clearly what kind of solutions were at hand because it was based on a modeling exercise because that's another way of utilizing data you know, to predict future uh, scenarios that could help us take decisions and motivate action. Uh, uh, black carbon and tropospheric ozone with its peak precursor being methane and uh, one of the most potent uh, um, greenhouse gases, demonstrated that 16 mesh specific measures in to, to in be introduced to uh, uh, clean, uh, avoid d diesel um, emissions, um, agriculture emissions from livestock in, and um, rice paddies, uh, brick kilns, uh, coke stoves, uh, some cooking uh, devices. If they, actually, they looked at three, four different emitting uh, from cooking, um, pellets and other things that would reduce by, imp by being implemented in, in the next 20 years, would reduce up to 80% of black carbon and, and more than 50% of methane emission uh, man-made uh, methane emissions. And this would help reduce more than half a degree of warming over the next 30 years. And this was extremely powerful information for people and policymakers that never thought about these issues before because it was so concentrated on CO2 and energy systems and, and a low carbon economy, which of course is the long long term target, that the information and the data simply opened up for venues and avenues of, 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 of fast action, quick results, and multiple benefits, because in, on top of the climate benefits and the temperature um, controls that was, uh, could be a, a result of these measures, there was also huge health benefits and very quantifiable uh, crop yields benefits, because ozone is also killing crops or, or reducing nutrition from from uh, from growth of crops. And 50 to 110 million uh, tons per year of of uh, staple crops could be saved or increased by taking these measures. And 2.4 million deaths could be avoided out of the many more million that the WHO uh, predict being, being uh, prematurely uh, lo losing their lives prematurely due to uh, air pollution of these emissions. And I think that kind of data in a, pre in, a, in a scenario for the future in the next 10, 20, 30 years is extremely powerful. And the co creating a coalition with the purpose and the objective of addressing these particular solutions, very specific ones, 
um, with a call for action and uh, among the willing and the working, let's say, that were took the lead on, and, and on top of the black carbon and tropospheric ozone with methane was also then the HFC issue, in which the Montreal Protocol, as you know, uh, already had a big stake because HFCs was the replacement of the ozone depleting substances, which was very successfully implemented with the caveat then that you introduce a different problem because you, you introduce a more climate forcing um, solution, which is not a which is not the solution to, to start with. So the information also helps um, decision makers to see all the different pros and cons. I mean, it's very easy if you only look at one problem to solve and you don't see how uh, it creates lateral problems that you need to solve further on, you're not, you're creating, a, it's kind of a, uh, loop that is not very sustainable for the future. So by creating a coalition of countries that wanted to take action because of a political drive and a policy uh, driven interest together with NGOs, companies and international financial institutions created a very powerful momentum for those Emission. So, for example, this coalition was created six years ago. It was based on science. This, it's accompanied by scientific continued uh, improvements, papers, developments that is being shared. Uh, it has created a huge momentum uh, in the Montreal Protocol to start with. Uh, countries and, and NGOs around this, this coalition really pushed the rest of the countries to... Um, adopt an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So it's not because of the, this coalition, but the coalition helped uh, as a kind of a high ambition uh, mode to get that global uh, amendment into place. When it comes to black carbon, which was always a, a, a something a little bit hidden and not very clear, soot is a bad thing, we know that, but it wasn't very clear neither what the health impact was and much less what the climate impact was. And just to say that uh, black carbon is not part of the basket of, of, of the other big convention, which is the, the UNFCCC, the climate uh, 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 convention. So over the years, there has been uh, a strong um, push and, uh, and change in one, the World Health Organization and its assembly and its ministries of, of, of health that has recognized now after a few, a few years since a few years that this is a problem it's part of their mandate there is a resolution to deal with these issues air pollution is now in the forefront and air pollution is one problem it's a health problem and they also now connect it up with their climate climate uh, uh, policies for 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 the health sector so that's one big gain that we have been able to to help generate the Kigali amendment on HFCs and on methane, which is the big challenge now, methane lives in the atmosphere for 10 to 12 years, but black carbon lives in the atmosphere for how long? Six, six days, a week, a few more. And, and by removing this from the atmosphere quickly, of course, the results are immediate. And, and cities, many of the, this coalition has then created also together with, with many of the agencies a movement around with cities to really... Um, combine air pollution policies with climate policies, uh, which the fact that the introduction of diesel in Europe, for example, I mean, there are so many things to talk about data because this is all data driven. That my point is that by having data that demonstrates what can be done on a right. positive side, like what the solution, it's not only the problem, it's also what the solution gives. You are talking about the cookstoves and what you're doing, and we are collaborating in this as well. But the most powerful part is to look at the benefits. So it's the multiple benefits approach that uh, this coalition has been uh, promoting, and we are not trying. So our priority is to get this into the negotiate into what countries are presenting to themselves, because in the end, it's it's a national driven um, commitment in the in the Paris Agreement for on on climate change in their nationally determined contributions. The intention is to increase ambition because we are very far from from achieving the stabilization of the climate to, to stay way below two degrees or towards 1.5 degrees. And that can only be done by data and, and methodologies that help countries to look at their own data and, and, and um, be able to uh, 
address the uh, connect the data with sectors and specific measures over time. And this is our priority for the time being. We are working with, uh, with uh, 60 plus countries um, and we are working through those countries to influence other countries in the climate space, but also in the air quality space. And, and by, by we, are, we are doing it through three different means. One, that we have the political leadership of these countries um, talking to each other and, and showcasing how to do it. And we have a, a scientific advisory panel and we have a trust fund. And the trust fund is to help generate results on the ground to, to showcase and demonstrate what is possible. Great, it's a true coalition approach. Um, I, I think what I think everybody has touched on a little bit is just the role and the power of data to maybe clarify um, the challenge, identify the right solutions. But I, I think one element we want to touch on maybe from everybody's perspective is the role of data and scale. And, and it, is it relevant to actually getting those solutions to scale? Uh, or is it just kind of an incremental help? And, and I know, Kevin, you guys talk all the time about scale and Mulago, so uh, maybe you can kind of start us off with your thoughts on this. On scale per se, or data and scale? Data <coughs> and scale, and is how big of a role can it play? Uh, well, I mean, data for us is mostly about showing that something's worth scaling. So, you know, the, those, those fundamental questions of, is it good enough? Data. Is it used? Data. Does it get to those who need it? That's all uh, uh, driven by data. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure that, that data plays a special role in scale. I mean, we think of scale as uh, a series of questions that we ask people about um, whether something, if the, the notion that something is scalable for us means that you understand who's going to be the doer at scale. In other words, is it uh, government that does it? Is it uh, the market that does it? Is it NGOs that do it? And so the question about scale there is, is your solution simple enough that those doers actually could do it? And then an, the other big question about scale for us is, who's your payer? And there's customers, philanthropy, taxes, and big aid. And so for a given solution, the data we're looking for there is, is it cheap enough that that payer would pay it? So, and then the final question about is scalability, if it's cheap enough that your payer would pay it, simple enough that your doer could do it, is it big enough to bother with? And that's really about having the information, the data that helps you understand, well, how big is the addressable market for this thing anyway? What's, how big is the playground it could play in? So I suppose all those things in every way are, are data-driven. Other perspectives? Well, I would just add very briefly, so as well, so as, well as the questions that, that you're, you're asking, what, um, you know, so da data on its own isn't enough to um, have a policymaker do something different on Monday. So, but you, it's very difficult to get the policymaker to do something different on Monday without the data, right? Uh, so what we find is that there's extraordinary amounts of data um, sitting in places um, and not doing very much. And, um, and then the questions that are being asked of that data uh, may not be the, you know, the best thought through or the questions that are being asked of the data are very traditional questions and we're just sort of incrementally walking down a path of just sort of updating our analysis of that data. So what, we, what we've found is that, you know, there's lots of data sitting around um, it, in places where there's not a lot of interest of, of inquiry from a different, from a different angle. And that the example I'll give you is, is, is just so on, you know, SDG 7, said, okay, we've got to have universal access to electricity, okay, fine. So, you know, there have been a bunch of sort of data custodians working together on well, who has access and who doesn't, and some kind of baseline. So we, we roughly knew that there was about a billion who didn't have access to anything, um, and then there were about three billion who have access to something, but it's not very reliable, so you're not going to be able to grow a business if you, you know, the electricity goes out 15 times a day or whatever. So we, we kind of had a broad sense 
of the shape of this animal. But we didn't know who these people were, where these people were. Uh, we didn't know... Um, and, and then there's a whole question of how much energy do you need, how much electricity would you need in order to start being productive within the economy and things like that. And so that's a very collaborative effort, right? And, and, you, and you have to have the user perspective in there. Um, and so now I think, you know, three years later, uh, first of all, we know a lot about who those billion are. We know where they are. Um, we, we know who has access to what amounts of uh, electricity, how much electricity you really need in order to be in the productive economy, and that number is different in different economies. And, and it's, we're not there yet, but we're building it, and that's a huge collaborative effort, and it requires sort of really curating the questions that you're going to ask of the data. And then the final, final thing that I would say is you've still then got to interest the policymaker in solving it for those problem, for those people. And so the data will get you so far. But knowing that the 650 million people in sub-Saharan Africa who have access to less than 12 watts of energy a day, i.e. they're not able to be productive in the economy, and that they're mainly women, and they're women in headed households, and they're in mostly remote areas, and then some of them are in peri-urban areas. You've still, you've still then got to use the partnership and the production of possible solutions. You've got to know a lot about what it's going to cost and who can solve what, until you can walk into the policymaker's room on Monday morning and say, you know what, not only is this a problem that you're going to need to address, this is a problem that should be in your top three priorities and it's an affordable problem for you to resolve, right? But you can't even get to the policymaker's door without that data. Okay, I'll, I'll come in just a little bit. For us, we think a lot of solutions in energy, especially um, when you talk about clean cooking, do have to scale via the market. But when we think about data, we think about it differently, I think, um, than uh, is traditionally used. So often, uh, I think traditionally, we talk about monitoring and evaluation, or m and and that tends to be a um, post facto exercise. Uh, a report is published, maybe put in a book somewhere. Um, and we think a lot about, when we think about data, we think about ongoing, day-to-day, -day, sustained. Um, do we know that something is being used? Do we know that that thing is working day in and day out? And so for us, we see data as being really critical in the delivery of um, a number of different interventions um, in order to scale. Um, first to figure out what's working and what's not to get to that basket of solutions and then as you're scaling um, to know that things are, are still working. But often what we found is that the data is actually critical in order to deliver things at scale. Um, when you look at our work in vaccine uh, refrigerators where um, we are um, in close to two thirds of all the clinics in India, um, our technology, what we're finding is that the data is critical on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that maintenance technicians are fixing fridges when they're needed. So this is not something that's a, a nice to have. This is not something that's a, a post facto, you know, the World Health Organization's reporting out on certain things. This is a, in order to keep vaccines safe and get kids safe vaccines, you literally need that data every day. And, um, you know, whether that translates exactly to cook stoves or not, um, you know, I think remains to be seen in terms of a routine day-to-day -day basis, but certainly as we're developing this basket of solutions, we see it as being critical. Um, and maybe the final thing I'll say, just to kind of, um, Manoj was saying something I think important um, before the panel about sharing um, of data. And so the final thing that I'll say here, um, and, and hope that Manoj will speak to it a little bit more, is um, we found that um, in clean cooking that there's really been sort of a siloed approach to learning um, where things tend to be much more subjective and, and really not shared. So there's a lot of, well, we think maybe this works here and, and you know, somebody else will say, oh, well, I think maybe something else works there. And there's really a lack of kind of um, a coherent conversation happening um, where everybody is very clear on what we're trying to do and how close are we to getting there. Um, you know, Rachel talks about this, um, I think, in really inspiring ways. And so, um, you know, along these lines, we're, we're really excited that um, with Tata Trusts um, and with Qualcomm and Autodesk, we'll be kind of putting together um, the beginnings of a partnership to start saying, how do we 
um, bring data on a day-to-day -day basis in clean cooking and bringing that data so that it's not just one organization um, hoarding and learning, but um, we're all working together, we're sharing, but we're also working towards common goals. And so at NextLeaf, when we think of clean cooking, um, we have four common goals. One is reducing emissions, 80% um, reduction in black carbon. Second is um, for, of the clean cooking solution. Second is usability. The woman should love the clean cooking solution. Third is durability. So you know the stove shouldn't require more than one service visit a year. And four is affordability, where the woman should be able to finance the solution um, in some reasonable way. So um, we think about data, I think, a little differently, perhaps, but in, in helping us answer and ensure that we're meeting all of these uh, criteria. Thanks, Nitya. You, you said that, you know, uh, uh, Kevin also mentioned about this, because, see, uh, uh, data is the key to risk management, right? So you, you cannot really predict anything uh, with a higher degree of probability if you don't collect, curate, analyze data. But one of the concerns that, and, and you, you mentioned this, uh, about the data sharing, right? So uh, we really feel uh, it, it's amazing that, uh, you know, people get funded on public money or philanthropic capital and don't share the data. Uh, and then everybody is trying to not only reinvent the wheel because, uh, you know, data is not accessible. So I think, it's increasingly important for philanthropy uh, to mandate that if a project uh, is funded with philanthropic capital, uh, open data, uh, you know, is is a mandatory requirement for that grant. Otherwise, in fact, uh, we should not be funding such project if the data openness uh, is not part of the project. It, 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 see, we are working on the intersection of, you know, climate change and public health, like indoor pollution, and, and it's so critical to share this data, you know. Uh, and I, I, I think, I, I, so we, we are starting to do that, but I think most philanthropists should now get into that space. It has to be mandated. Just to add something, because it was about scale, no? How do we get to scale? So to me, one aspect we didn't talk about is also what, how does data transform into information that's actionable, no? So I think that's another uh, big issue that is of importance. And how does technical data or scientific data become uh, relevant for those that have to do something with it? So if it's at community level and women's or, or, or other like producers of bricks or whatever it is, the data needs to make sense to them. And it makes to be become like a, a story to be told. So that's one. And the second is that the data and the information that what we have seen, the power of change, is really when there is a connection between what works here, what works there, what works there. So it's sharing of the data per se, but it's also sharing of the what's done with the data, what's Absolutely. what's the results, and then how you connect with people that, that basically replicate what others have done. And this is how the big changes in the world has happened. You know, you look at, you know, I come from Sweden, you know, one day people were starving, like next year, everybody was planting potatoes that they had no idea even existed, no? So it's just because you, you, you and I mean, that's a, probably a stupid example, but I think that's something that has to do with how we, how we use this data into like pieces of information that make people tick. Absolutely. So um, just to be conscious of time, I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask the panelists um, some questions. So opening up to the floor. Go ahead. can think of some good people to take this question on this panel who would like to start. I can only give you a couple of examples. Uh, this whole product push approach has not taken us anywhere. 
Uh, I live in a country where people have been trying to push microgrids for several years. Not a single one is sustainable and actually, you know, people using it. While household rooftop solar has been extremely successful because people have the ownership of assets. So uh, funders have product push preference because they are very close to product management and product development. What they need to do is to make sure that their product development companies are actually developing those products with the community on the ground and iterating with them, which very few people do it. Very few people do it. That uh, locally derived solutions thing is an interesting one. I mean, if I'm trying to come up with a solution, I would think I would want to access all the good thinking in the world to come up with the best solution. But then it has to be filtered through the needs of the particular user. So I never quite understood that locally, the, the notion that I mean, if I'm sick, I want a solution that came from the whole world working on it. I don't want some one village to produce the solution I need. But the solution for that village needs to be filtered through the views and the culture and the beliefs and the habits of that village. And that's where I kind of see the relationship between local and global solutions. Nithya? I'll add to that. I, what we see in terms of the role of data is um, data is one part, but a critical part to helping to create new markets and tying to what um, Kevin and, and Manoj were both saying that we see data as serving as, as one part in terms of um, representing the voice of, of customers and preferences. And one, not the whole, but one compelling point to kind of help access global um, resources. So what we're hoping is that with better data on women's preferences, on what's working and what's not working, we can then use that to help entrepreneurs get to solutions that will work. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Great. I think I saw some other hands. Please. Uh, So we didn't talk too much about it here, but with Project Surya, we developed, um, I think you're referring to sensor-enabled climate financing, um, where uh, women, based on their usage of stoves, were given small payments. Um, we created a, um, a donor-based climate fund, so not connected to a carbon market, um, but rather a climate fund that rewarded not only um, reductions in emissions of carbon dioxide, um, but the other stuff that comes out of cooking that you've heard about now here, uh, black carbon. So small particulates um, that uh, heat the planet, settle on glaciers and melt glaciers, but also settle in lungs um, and is one of the things that uh, do kill people because of uh, cooking. And so um, women were essentially rewarded with small payments based on the sensor-derived um, usage of the data. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of, I won't talk too much about blockchain here. I think um, what we see is that um, there's certainly a lot of um, excitement uh, about blockchain. Um, we see that there's um, certainly certain applications where blockchain can be important. Um, and I, I think there's just not enough um, of a broad um, understanding of um, exactly um, where that is and, and the type of role that it can play. But, um, you know, we're certainly uh, continuing to learn ourselves uh, sort of what that role can be. So if, if, I, if I could add, I, so one of the things that, that I see uh, happening, um, and, and I would agree on the, on the blockchain uh, comment, uh, is 
so the the, the the there has been an investment of of climate finance and carbon credits etc into the cooking um sort of nexus or the or the, the issue and what's what that's driven is um an incredible um an incredibly long sometimes checklist of things that have to be done or uh, uh, arrive at in order to qualify for the credits so park that thought for a moment then look at the fact that there is no or at best nascent market for clean fuels for cooking cook stoves for cooking in the places where this is of desperate need yet we have an extremely sophisticated financial product which is hanging out there normally as some kind of results-based financing the valley of death between that product and where almost every entrepreneur is or every dependent upon development finance entrepreneur is or every you know impact investor who thinks they're doing private equity but they've never exited a deal so really all they're doing is giving money you know through a very difficult philanthropic process is huge so i don't want to knock anybody in that in that process but i think we have to be i think the sdgs and and paris demand of us a little bit of honesty and discipline about what we're trying to do here and the the and and the bit that's missing and which is why i think this week gcas is so important because of the people who've come here and what california has brought together is that we need people who are prepared to put money at risk in the development of markets that don't exist which means that some of this money is going to be thrown away some of it's not going to ever come back we're going to have to invest in good old fashioned market creation and the other there are and there are all kinds of other interesting questions right which is why are the domestic financial markets in these countries not at all invested in providing clean cooking solutions for billions of people right so this this is in this is not indigenized financially at all all the money that's coming into clean cooking is coming from you know people in this room and people in Europe and whatever and a few enlightened uh, uh, others so we've got this massive health problem massive economic problem massive contribution to the to the deforestation of parts of sub-saharan africa potential problem when it comes to climate change and local capital markets local financiers local government is not engaged in this at all so there's room for carbon credits there's room for all of this sophistication but if we don't have the other stuff it's it's not going to it's not going to move forward with the kind of results that everybody wants um and that's a perfect example of you know designing sitting in a room and i mean i say this because i spent years in the world bank group where we had shareholders saying you know we want you to use carbon credits for this that and the other and so you design it and you know lots of smart economists lots of smart people it's designed and it doesn't get used and what happens is that the staff get rewarded for the design of the product and the product goes to the board and it gets approved and everybody's happy the product is never dispersed and 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 you know and then the monitoring and evaluation of the fact that it wasn't dispersed goes under the carpet and i mean i'm being more cynical than i need to be but we can't do that anymore we did it after kyoto we did it up to paris but we can't do it anymore we've got to wrestle with the other problems that are stopping us from getting to scale and then and then there'll be room for and then there'll be room for carbon credits but you can't build a market off carbon credits well we've never been able to do it yet It's a good question. It's a big question. Um, I think we're very focused on scale. Um, we're very focused on how do you um, launch and shape and you know help create new markets to solve problems. Um, right now, we are very focused in clean cooking and vaccine cold chain. Um, what 
I will say is that we do see um, adjacencies. So when you talk about agriculture, for example, um, I think what you're referring to is, is crop burning. So for example, crop burning, uh, one of the um, bigger contributors to air pollution, um, certainly in India, um, across the uh, Indo-Gangetic Plain especially, um, so, so yeah, something like that, that is not a problem that we think we can tackle. You know, we know the problem, um, and we kind of know the solution. Um, and that, you know, so that, that's not an area that I think, um, I see NextLeaf being able to play a transformative role. Um, I think, uh, you know, where we think we can make a big difference is where you have massively complex and distributed um, solutions like vaccine cold chain and clean cooking. And so um, in agriculture, one thing we are looking at just briefly is um, uh, cooling because our refrigeration and cooling will become one of the biggest drivers of climate change, both because of the energy use as well as the um, HFCs. Um, and so looking at climate smart um, cooling um, and how we get there um, especially as um, you know, we start thinking about cold chain all the way down to smallholder farmers, I think is a potential area um, that uh, we are uh, starting to explore, but um, I think we need to learn a lot more before we can understand what that market can look like and, and you know, where the solutions need to be. Also, we probably need to incubate more companies who can you know, learn from existing ones and, and get into new spaces. So. You're already talking about it. How do we find more entrepreneurs and incubate them? Uh, the gentleman in the back. Hey, yes, I just wanted to follow up on, uh, you said that local, uh, local areas, they're not particularly interested in the, the East Coast, so it's not really on their radar, so it's coming from the outside. Are there, do you have uh, examples in India or wherever? Why that? Why they would be interested in something that's, that's uh, so significant for human health, etc. I'll take a, a quick pass. I mean, I, I think the question was for Rachel, um, who had talked about that. But I'll just say, you know, one thing. I think the implication of of what you're saying is, um, why wouldn't people want to do something that's good for their health? Um, and you know, I'll I'll just take an example closer to home. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, one of the more polluted cities in the US. Um, I live near a very um, heavily trafficked uh, freeway, and I've got two small kids. So perhaps you should direct the question to me, because I know uh, I have a father who's a climate scientist who's <laughs> done a lot of the foundational research. Um, why am I not moving my children away from this freeway? How could I possibly uh, do this? And, and you know, I think, to me, this gets to um, you know these types of decisions and, and how we make them are difficult. Now, that being said, I do think when you talk about clean cooking, um, I also think that we don't yet have the solutions that even make these types of shifts easy. Um, and so, you know, this is a big, big complex issue. I think reducing it to um, why don't women, uh, you know, understand and, and make better decisions for their families is. Um, maybe a little reductionist. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think really kind of thinking more broadly about the system solutions and um, how we get there. But also, yes, putting responsibility on each individual as well, um, you know, I think will help us get there. So I, I'd made two comments. My last comment was, was that, you know, that there's no local finance going into this solution. And I think that that's because the size of the market is not um, well revealed, and also the size of the opportunity, uh, you know, t and, and, and then there's a dearth of entrepreneurs that one could finance, and then I think these the, the, the other generic problems we have, we have about solutions. I think there's been a lot of sort of haggling over what's a clean cook stove, um, and that there's been a, a lack of sort of creativity around distribution finance and consumer finance, where you actually empower people to be able to acquire a cleaner fuel. Um, and then well, that gets us into all questions of sort of gas versus improved cook stoves we won't discuss tonight. Um, but then uh, the, the comment that I made at the very beginning is, you know, why would a political leader, you know, not jump on this problem? And I think that what's, what's been interesting is that there have been countries that have made fast progress. Um, um, you know, Mexico had about uh, 30,000 uh, families who didn't have access to uh, clean fuels for cooking, mainly in Chiapas in the south. 
um, at the beginning of Peña Nieto's term, they more or less closed that gap now, and that's because they basically worked with the gas companies to get LPG out. Uh, Peru has done the same thing. Uh, Indonesia did very well, and then has had a bit of a setback. Um, but that's because they the political leaders put their mind to it, worked with mainly LPG and, and, and other sort of companies and sort of found solutions. And then, of course, the most famous recent, you know, is Prime Minister Modi, who, you know, made some very, very big pledges when he came into office and certainly galvanised parts of um, government and has galvanised uh, other people down the sort of food chain and galvanised the Indian oil company and others to be part of, of something um, interesting now. The jury's out on how effective that's been and how many people are sustainably sort of resolved now. Um, and, and which brings me back to the, the key point, right, which is, you know, if, if you're going to have... If, if, a, if a leader is going to put their name to a pledge to do something about it, they have to at least have some understanding of the issue, which means they need data and evidence, and they need a way to be able to say at the end of their elected term or whatever, and this is what we've done takes you back to the data and the evidence. Great. Thank you all so much for this evening's conversation and thank you all for the great questions. Um, I think we're going to close off and please feel free to kind of hang around. I think some of us will be around to continue the, the discussion. <laughs>